During World War II, the Allies were in the process of planning their strategic target prioritization. During the Casablanca Conference in January 1943, they devised what became known as the Point Blank Directive. This placed all primary targets in German-occupied Europe according to priority, such as aircraft industry, shipbuilding ports, U-boat pens, petroleum and rail networks, including marshalling yards. Trains were a primary target as they moved materiel and troops and were given priority for tactical fighter bombing and strafing. But Germany had a plan to combat the Allies and protect their trains. What were flak trains? What were the Dark Knight trains? How was each dangerous in their own way? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, a veteran of the United States Army and Marine Corps, former history professor, book author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. Long before American fighters could reach deep into German-held territory, coastal targets and those just inside France, Belgium, and Holland were able to be reached. From August 1942 until the end of the war, railways, marshalling yards, and trains were always favorite targets for fighter and bomber pilots. Fighter pilots destroyed a lot of German rail traffic, and this, in fact, was one of the most effective tactical methods employed by the U.S. Army Air Forces and the RAF. But the Germans adapted and they decided that a retaliatory application was needed, so they created flak trains. These were locomotives that pulled what appeared to be standard railway cars, but with a twist. German rail fell under the authority of the Reichsbahn and its director, Julius Dorpmüller. Due to the large numbers of trains that were being damaged and destroyed by tactical bombing and strafing throughout occupied Europe, but after the beginning of 1944, the losses were becoming unbearable, so the Wehrmacht created flak trains in response. These German flak units were organized from the division level downward, such as flak division, flak regiment, flak battalion, down to flak batteries. It was the individual anti-aircraft battery that would be assigned to an individual train, and all flak units were under the air ministry, but subordinated to the Reichsbahn director until 1944. That was when Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering took that authority for himself to bolster the Kamuber Line defenses. The Kamuber Line, developed by Field Marshal Josef Kamuber for inclusion into the German home defense strategy, included several miles of defensive anti-aircraft placed in depth and strategically located, which included searchlights and various radar locations. This defensive plan was created to work in conjunction with the German night fighter force created and commanded by Colonel Wolfgang Falk throughout the war until Kamuber was sent to Norway to command Luftflotte 5. Trains were a favorite target for armed tactical reconnaissance missions. Allied fighter pilots found them rather easy targets when using guns and rockets. As they were a primary target, any train, let alone trucks or vehicles traveling on roads in daylight, were vulnerable. However, in adapting to the threat, the Germans changed their tactics and quickly made strafing them more challenging and dangerous affair. In the beginning, to protect the much-needed supplies and troops transported to the front, the Wehrmacht began mounting flat guns aboard some of the train cars for defense. Usually, every fourth or fifth car in a long train would have anti-aircraft guns. But this was later changed, so that the car directly behind the locomotive and the last car would be flat cars as well, with at least one more in the center, if not a few others, spaced out to provide an even more firepower and coverage scenario. Both 20mm and 37mm flat guns became the standard weapons aboard German trains due to their range and rapid fire capability. Some trains also carried MG42 machine guns as well. On trains carrying high-value commodities such as fuel, coal, ammunition, or soldiers, an additional gun car would be placed in front of the locomotive as well. The general tactic for Allied pilots was to destroy the locomotive first, stopping the train. Then, the remaining rail cars would then be strafed or hit with bombs or rockets. Once stopped, attacking a train on the flank with rockets was preferred, as that made for a wider target with a greater chance of every rocket hitting home. Then the strafing with machine guns or cannons would normally be done running the length of the train from front to back or vice versa to inflict as much additional damage as possible. Many of the early flak train cars were flatbeds exposed to the elements, allowing for clear fields of view. 
Any alert of an enemy fighter would allow the gun crews to rapidly rotate their weapons and acquire the incoming target. But the Allied pilots also adapted, and when they saw the open flatbed cars with guns, they would attack them first, then disable the locomotive once the defensive fire had been neutralized. But as one may expect, the Germans decided to adapt and camouflage their flat cars by installing their weapons in regular boxcars with four walls but no roof. These resembled coal carriers, a nice target, but with a sneaky catch. These special cars could immediately drop the sides to expose the guns once enemy aircraft were detected. Some even had removable roofs that could be thrown open like a cardboard box and increase concealment and enhance the ambush method. The mobile flak protection did catch Allied pilots off guard and many American and British pilots would find themselves taking a lot of ground fire as they attacked, many being killed or captured as a result. On March 12, 1945, for example, 404th Fighter Group 9th Air Force Commanding Officer Colonel Leo Moon got a rude awakening when he attempted to rocket and strafe two trains. As he said, I first saw a train with a number of cars on it and fired my four rockets into it, damaging the locomotive and setting two tank cars on fire. Then I saw a plume of smoke some distance away and fired my guns at the base of it. As I got nearer, I saw that the smoke was coming out of a short tunnel and a train was protruding from the other end. So I swung around to make an attack on it. I saw a little red ball flash past my wing and I wondered what that was. I soon found out. I saw some smoke coming from up in the middle of the train and thought that it was a funny place for a train to be smoking. I suddenly realized it was gun smoke from a flat car banging away at me. I had already committed myself, however, and I banked around and sprayed the cars and pulled up into the overcast. The flak sounded like hail on a tin roof as it hit my plane. My brake was shot out, and there was just a hole in my wing where my pitot tube had been. Moon was one of the lucky ones, and his rugged P-47 Thunderbolt only took a few 20mm hits in the left wing. Had a more experienced gun crew been involved, without a P-47 bearing down on them, it would more than likely have adjusted their fire and brought this aircraft down. The 404th Fighter Group ground crews repaired this damaged aircraft and it was back in the air within a few days. But the Germans also had dedicated trains that were nothing but flak trains, where every boxcar carried flak guns and many carried the very lethal 88mm, which was devastating. These trains rolled around Europe, being vectored to locations by radar and pilots. On a large enemy formation of bombers, whether British at night or Americans by day, the trains would follow the bomber formation, supporting the fixed stationary flak units surrounding cities, industrial facilities, and marshalling yards. These special dedicated flak trains were also used as mobile support in areas that did not have their own permanent anti-aircraft capabilities. According to Josef Kamuber, whom I interviewed and knew, he stated, these trains with flak support were almost the only protection our railways had from aerial destruction. Yes, they were effective, but we did not have enough of them, so they were just far too little coming much too late. Some trains were specifically built or upgraded into dedicated flak trains. These were more heavily armored trains, covered in additional steel plates, and they would roll during daylight hours, hoping to draw Allied air attacks into their kill zone, where as many as 20 railroad cars attached to a locomotive would all be carrying flak guns. Few Allied attack pilots survived these encounters. Flak trains were an interesting method of employing defensive methods on a transportation network, but there was another version of German stealth trains that would help take a great toll of Allied airmen's lives. These were the Dark Knight trains. When Wolfgang Falk, a friend of mine and a subject I interviewed many times, created the Night Fighter Force in 1940, he started working with Kamuber, and together they created a lethal defensive posture. With the advent of onboard airborne radar for night fighters, working in conjunction with the Freie, Himmelbett, and Würzburg Gerät systems, German night fighters destroyed most of the bombers lost by RAF Bomber Command during the war. The German ground radar sites would detect incoming bombers that left England after nightfall. They would then pass on their contacts to the next ground radar site in a chain reaction. Meanwhile, Luftwaffe night fighter units would take off, vectored to the locations they were given over the radio. Often their first indication would be seeing the hundreds of searchlights stabbing up into the dark sky, hoping to lock onto a bomber. Their radar-guided flak guns of the 88mm and 105mm variety would launch their projectiles at their predetermined altitude. While the ground radars tracked the bombers, the formations would fly past their range, often into gaps between various radar locations, 
This was where the Dark Knight trains came into play. These specialized trains did not carry flat guns. They were rolling radar stations and radio communication centers, moving across Europe as a mobile radar unit. As one ground facility lost contact, the radar trains often maintained contact, passing their information to the radar-guided night fighters, and later, from 1943 onward, to the wild board night fighters, who used single-seat day fighters to hunt down the bombers, and this unit was commanded by my late friend, Colonel Hayo Hermann. Each train was a totally self-contained operation, complete with sleeping quarters, bathrooms, and a full kitchen. The men operating the radars would work in two-hour shifts so that fresh men were on the scopes at all times. They were also integrated into the overall cam Uber system, which also saw the Kriegsmarine involved. As stated by Wolfgang Falk, he said, We had a spy ship, steamer, in the North Sea, packed with all the necessary radar and communications equipment, and it worked as a floating early warning system and controller platform. I had also worked with Deutsche Bahn, and we had a special train fitted with special rail cars. One contained radio communications gear, one for the pilot's sleeping quarters, a library, and a galley for preparing meals. I designed Oberleutnant Heinrich Prince Zusein Wittgenstein as the first commander of the Dark Knight train, and they were operating out of Russia at first. I had special orders issued for another such train for the West, hence my meeting with Colonel General Yashanik and Field Marshal Erhard Milch. I had to travel from the Black Sea to Finland, then Norway, and through the Balkans. These inspections were also to look at any gaps in the defensive network, and we had quite a few, to be honest. Luftwaffe night fighter ace Hans Joachim Japs, who had 50 victories, 28 at night, told me during his interview, the night trains were really a marvel at helping coordinate us while in the air. Ground units often lost radar contact, and we would have to just fly to the last known location or anticipate where the enemy bombers were. The trains were often able to fill those gaps in the radar and guide us into the bomber streams with great results. The German night fighter defenses would see the British and Commonwealth forces suffer 73,741 total casualties, including wounded and killed, with the British suffering 38,462 deaths alone. Total deaths for all Commonwealth Bomber Command forces were 55,500. The Dark Knight trains were just one part of the Kamuber line of air defense. U.S. Air Force General Curtis E. LeMay even said, The Kamuber defense system was definitely one of the marvels of the air war in Europe. Thank you for watching Forgotten History. Please click like, subscribe, and share. Send us comments and show ideas, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.